But what I'm going to talk about today is managing turkeys in agricultural landscape. That's an area which I've worked in with quail quite a bit, and it translates over a lot to wild turkeys. Now, another interesting thing, if you haven't figured it out between the first two speakers, by the end of this presentation, you should have a good idea that we're all really talking about the same thing when it comes down to turkey management, management to produce turkeys, not necessarily to attract turkeys. Um, we're going to cover a lot of the same issues, a lot of the same management practices, but not in the woods and more open areas that you may have on a property. Uh, not too much around here, but when you get into some uh, agricultural landscapes where it's nothing but ag, you have some limitations in terms of habitat, and this goes not only for turkeys, but also for, uh, from a quail state. Generally what you see is a lack of herbaceous cover, ground cover, all that stuff that's about waist high and below. You know, where bir uh, birds are getting their insects, getting their seeds, nesting in, and so forth. Shrunk <coughs> cover, or more. Uh, uh, importantly, you see from some of these pictures, there's just no old fence rows, no uh, uh, old fallow areas which, which have been t temporarily taken out of production and so forth. If you take a look at, at this photo relative to turkeys, there's not a lot of woods in that landscape. There's a few pockets here and there, a few isolated pockets intermixed in a whole bunch of, of, of agricultural land, whether it's grazing or row crop. And that presents a challenge if you're trying to manage turkeys within this type of habitat. Uh, granted, around here we don't have uh, 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 that intensive of, of agriculture going on. You know, this is an extreme example. This is actually a picture from Mississippi Delta. Um, folks kind of wonder, well, we ain't got enough turkeys to quail. Well, there's a reason for that. You, you don't have any cover. You need to find that habitat for them in order to actually get birds. <coughs> You can't even attract birds in there because there's no birds to attract. So you can plant all the chufa you want, which is a great, great food uh, uh, item for turkeys. They love it. They eat it like can. Well, hogs do too. Uh, um, but you can't attract what you don't have uh, in that type of system. Here's an area of photo to kind of illustrate uh, uh, some of the, the isolation that may occur between habitats in some of these agricultural landscapes. Now, turkeys can fly. They're very mobile. But I think Ted had mentioned uh, within a day's time you can find a gobbler three miles away. You know, they're very mobile, whether it's walking or flying, <coughs> most of the time walking, they can get around quite well. However, if you take into consideration, movement's one thing, but move from this block to this block, there's always a predation risk. Okay, when you got cross open ground, no use open ground. Uh, uh, for sure, you know, along the edges of these fields, along these woods, and so forth, and you'll eventually get some birds trans uh, dispersing across back and forth. Uh, but linking up some of these wood wooded blocks can go a long way uh, to making that habitable or that landscape more suitable for uh, turkeys. So you saying plant trees across the, the field? In some cases, yes. Yes, tree rows. Well, what about the fact that some places this ain't gonna have no turkey? Hmm? Well, you gotta have turkey first. And you're developing we'll be getting that. You gotta have half of that person, you gotta have some turkeys to work with. That's not the only thing. What I'm saying here, you know, as this for 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 an example, you know, if these producers want to take some land out of production, they can potentially link up these two woodlots, make it easier for birds move back and forth, mm -hmm. okay? But you still got to get to the nesting group area. That, depending on which landscape you're in, that can or cannot be a limited factor. In this case, it's probably not too much of a factor. In the Mississippi Delta, where that picture I showed you before, it can be a serious problem, okay? Um, generally, what we're looking at, and this goes whether you're in forested or open lands, is diversity. And you have plant diversity, diversity in age classes of plant communities, diversity in woods versus open land, uh, and this whole <coughs> interspersion and juxtaposition. <coughs> Having all your stuff is easily accessible to birds. You don't want all your nesting habitat on this section and three miles away in the property. If you have a large property, have all your brooder and habitat down. You've got to mix that stuff up so each animal or <coughs> group of uh, uh, birds can access all, all they need, food, cover, and water um, requirements that they have. What is pretty much a truism all around, whenever you're managing for turkeys or quail or deer, 
monocultures or anything are rarely <coughs> ever good. Okay? We say a lot of times plant native warm season grasses are great for quail and great for turkeys. They're good deer bedding areas. Well, does that mean go out and plant a homogenous stand of big blue stem? No. It means plant a diversity, three or four different native warm season grasses, mixed in with probably about two or three different forbs. A diverse stand of native warm season grasses, as an example. Now, now, an important thing to realize, and, and, and I know, I think Claude and Ted have hit upon this, is a lot of management, regardless of what you do, we'll be talking about turkeys, is really managing succession, okay? And, and, and when we manage for brood rearing habitats, which typically occur about the first year after a burn or, or, or some type of solar distance uh, disturbance, or uh, 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 nesting habitat, which tends to be about you know three, four, five years, where you get a little bit more of a brushy component mixed in with your grasses. That's on a gradient, a successional gradient, and all we're doing is managing that successional gradient or that piece of property in a specific successional uh, or part of that successional gradient. Okay, if you do management and you walk away from it. You know, that bird rearing habitat, a few years down the road, is going to transition into nesting habitat. That's probably what we want to need to do. However, once it starts going up that succession of gradient, it's going to work out of the nesting habitat, and, and, and thus the quality is going to decline. It's going to get in too much wood, it's going to shade out that understory, you're going to lose the grasses, you're going to lose the forbs, and it become, eventually becomes a, a uh, stand of trees. And this is what we mean when uh, we talk about success, succession. And looking at right there, uh, you know, both Claude and Ted hit on the fact we're nesting habitat. We're looking specifically at that mixture, that age class, where we're seeing some of that shrubby component uh, 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 in either your open land or your forest mixed in with grasses. Rudering habitat. That's primarily what we're looking at there, one, two, maybe three years after burning or disking or some type of, of disturbance uh, uh, to the ground. And then roosting habitat. Roosting habitat generally is not a problem, especially in the southeast. <coughs> Birds are going to find trees to roost. Uh, you know, if you're in Kansas, if you're in Kansas, Texas, some areas of Texas, yeah, that could potentially be a problem, but still, you know, turkeys roost that high in a mesquite tree. They're off the ground. Um, we generally don't worry too much about roosting habitat. There's a lot of it. They're going to find some place to fly up and roost in. What we do focus all of our attention on, and you've heard this both from Claude and, and, and Ted, is brood rearing habitat and nesting habitat. And intentionally <coughs> premeditated management uh, to create those habitats. Because they're the real bottleneck to a, a turkey population. Okay? This, these are some average rates of nest success. Our first nest uh, attempt, the re nesting, you know, if they do, do re nest, you know, a little bit more variability in there. Uh, but the real hang up is look at this pulse mortality. In 14 days, you're going to lose 50 to 80% of your poles. Okay? <coughs> up to, from, from past to sometime in the fall, you can expect on average three quarters of are going to die for one, one reason or another. Okay, there's a lot of variability in there, but on average, those are some average rates that you're looking at. So, you can increase the nesting success through providing ample and high quality habitat. We know that that's that true from the literature uh, and experience. If you can increase whole uh, survival significantly through providing ample brood rearing habitat, insects, uh, and so forth, you can increase pole survival. Okay, or at least have a better chance of increasing that. One of the biggest drivers of nest success and to some extent pole mortality, <coughs> we have no control over. What do y'all think it is? One of the big drivers of it? Hmm? What did you say? What's the the driver. Point? One of the biggest, greatest significant influences to nest success and, 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 and seven percent full survival. We all think it is. We ain't got any weather. control. Weather. weather, exactly. Okay. So keep that in mind. You may have optimum habitat. You get a bad weather here. Okay. And that success extremely low. 
but you still have that good habitat. So when uh, uh, um, you get a good weather year, boom, they're cranking out nests. So they don't have a problem finding a good, high quality nesting habitat. That's really what you're shooting for. Um, another thing with this, you know, first thing often comes to folks is my thing, wow, huh, what if we just kill the predators? That's going to boost our nest success, our bolt survival. We'd be done with it. You ain't got to screw with this habitat business. Uh, I, th I think Steve's going to talk a little bit about that. You know, some of the ins and outs of predator management, and you really have to look at the effectiveness of doing it. In order to do it correctly to significantly <coughs> increase turkey populations, you got, it's got to be fairly intensive uh, uh, over a relatively large uh, uh, area in order to have a chance at increasing that, 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 that turkey population by reducing predators. But still, the underlying factor still remains, if you don't have any habitat, you do predator management, the simple equation is you're going to end up with no habitat, with no predators, and still no turkeys. Uh, bottom line. And over and over again, that's why we focus all of our attention. You've heard it from a professional uh, forester and wildlife consultant, you know, a biologist from AWF, you're hearing it from an academic type, uh, you'll hear it from the state agency folks. It's a really a habitat issue. Uh, but I think Steve's going to cover more of the ins and outs of, of the predator thing, so I don't want to get too far in there. But just keep in mind, we're managing habitat. If we want to produce, i.e. have increased survival and, and, and nest success in wild turkeys. Um, just some general needs, and, and again, I hate to reiterate what, what, what Claude and Ted had really covered, but we're all speaking the same language because that's really the bottom line. You know, it's really interesting to know because two years ago we did this seminar in uh, Pat's Autogaville, and, and of course Pat, you know, got all these speakers together to talk about different topics, and he was talking about agricultural lands and Ted's hardwood <coughs> pine. Uh, Claude was doing pines and stuff, and we never communicated. But when we got in that room and we started watching everybody's presentation, we're like, huh. Well, of course, by the time it got to me, I was like, well, what do I talk about? Y'all have already talked about what I need to talk about. <laughs> uh, and, and that's the same case here, but we're going through this reiteration to really hammer home the fact brood-rearing habitat and nesting habitat if you really want to produce turkeys, okay? Increase or have a population level in that. Um, nesting, uh, you know, a little bit about three to eight years after <coughs> succession, there's a lot of variability in there. But your fruit bearing is your early succession area, right after prescribed burning or disking that soil disturbance. And here's why. Oh, well, I'll get to it in a minute. Now, you've got plenty of options, plenty of areas where you can do turkey management. You just have to look at your property or, 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 or an area that you're leasing and figure out, okay, I got a same cutover. How can I use that for turkey habitat? Okay. We've got an old field, a 30 acre old field that you know we kind of taken out of production. It's overgrown right now, it's sweet gum. It doesn't really have much going on with it. How can we turn that area into turkey habitat? You have to really start picking and identifying uh, these areas on your property. Um, the importance of early succession, I can't stress it enough. And this goes mainly to poles whether you're quail chicks or turkey pole, pretty much the same, same habitat requirements. Uh, if you look at turkey poles, you know, they're, they're, they're coastal, they'll, they'll hatch out like ducklings, and, you know, they got downy feathers, and boom, they're off and running uh, within 24 hours of the mother, they're leaving that nest. Their diet, though, um, first two weeks, pretty much all insects, okay? And that is very, very important because they're looking for about a 26, 23, 26 percent protein diet, and that's exactly what insects provide. Okay. Now, um, you can see here, you know, 80 percent, and then it gradually shifts by about a month or so. A, a pulse diet's pretty close to that of an adult bird. Okay. Not identical, but, but they've really shifted off the insects. Uh, they, they don't have uh, as much of a protein demand, and, and, and they're going back to a normal tuber uh, and, and vegetation type of diet. Now, why insects are so darn important? There's a simple equation that we use. Abundant insects equals 
was more protein that birds can easily get so they can grow feathers faster. But the faster they can grow the feathers, the sooner they can fly. The sooner they can fly, the sooner they can get up and roost up in trees. As soon as they can roost in trees, their survival shoots right up. Okay? Hmm? Oh yeah. As soon as you can start roosting in that tree, your survival rate goes up. <coughs> that is why it's so critical that we manage for brood bearing habitats, these early succession habitats, which are grasses and forest by nature, which attract a, a bunch load of insects. The second thing about early successional habitats that are very important is all that duff and garbage has been cleared off, and you just got a whole bunch of little stems coming up. <coughs> it's relatively open beneath that grassy forby canopy. You're that tall, well, probably about that tall to that tall. You gotta move around and catch those bugs. The more efficient you are at catching those bugs, the less energy you have to expend. And translate that energy into feather growth, getting bigger, okay? <laughs> if it costs you a lot of energy, I gotta run here and grab this bug, and I go 100 yards that way, grab from my now 100 yards, 20 yards that way, grab me another bug before I can catch and get to it. Or I've got a lot of, uh, 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 of understory duff or litter layer obstructing me from catching these bugs. I may not be able to get there by the time that bug crawls up the stem, okay? So there's a foraging efficiency effect of these, these, these early succession habitats, okay? You need copious amounts of insects, because again, that whole relationship, the sooner you grow your feathers, the sooner you can fly up into a tree and your survival increases. That's a very critical part of, of, of turkey ecology, or at least whole survival. <coughs> um, again, I've already kind of gotten ahead of myself, the cycle of new growth, and you're producing insects. If you're a turkey pole or a quail chick, you can easily navigate around through here, a lot more so than if there were, say, a dense fescue uh, patch or, and so forth. Uh, but hey, you know, some of your exotic forage side forming grasses. It's much easier to move around, catch those bugs, which are already abundant. Okay? And while you're doing it, you've got a nice canopy screening your overhead uh, um, of those grasses and forbs, which is going to make it harder for predators to nail you. Okay? Or your mama, either or. Um, the common practices? that we tend to use in ag landscapes or open lands are going to be very similar, identical to what you will in, in most of your forested environment. Burning, disking, uh, using herbicides, in some cases uh, depending on where you're at, grazing, or light managing your grazing uh, schedule. In row crop fields, if you're doing you know, beans, corn, uh, cotton, and so forth, conservation buffers, planting those tree or shrub uh, components to link up habitats uh, across your property. And of course, hardwood plants and so forth, if you choose to go that way. Um, one thing which I always advise folks, because uh, uh, the most popular question I get as an extension specialist, what do I plant for deer? What do I plant for quail? What do I plant for turkeys? And then I've got to go through and ask, well, what's your objective? Why want a lot of turkeys? <coughs> okay. Is, is it really, do you want to manage for turkeys or do you want to just attract turkeys and so forth? And then from there, figure out what, what really is that landowner's objective. And oftentimes, they want it to do habitat management, but they think they need to feed something, plant something for animals to eat. Uh, but as Joel Glover says, animals do more than eat. Yeah, you know, they eat, uh, 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 well, they do a lot more than eat. You know, they breed, they roost, uh, uh, they re rear young and so forth. And, and that's what we need to, to really focus our attention on. But when we get down to actually managing some of these old fields, uh, rather than just recommending, well, native more seasons, grasses are great, you need to go out and plant those, and then be done with it, you know, interact in some ragweed, some partridge oh. pea, and you got a perfect mix. Uh, what I generally try to recommend to folks is, you know, unless they got a, a, a boatload of money and they want to spend it, right. Um, is go out, you know, you know, see what's in your seed bank, okay? You know, some disking, some burning, may produce all the grasses and forbs that you'd ever want, okay? Or maybe a herbicide application uh, can release a lot of favorable native uh, 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 and sometimes exotic plants 
uh, uh, that are in that seed bank. So that's one thing kind of keep in mind when it comes to managing uh, oil field habitats. So you encourage like burning the field and everything too? Hmm? You encourage like burning the field? Yep, I'm getting there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're like three steps, probably <laughs> six or seven slides ahead of me. I like that. I like that. Uh, uh, we're getting there. Uh, some of your exotic grasses, uh, 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 depending on uh, uh, where they're at, you'll see birds out in, in uh, pasture fields. Uh, you know, it can be bugging areas. Again, it depends upon that grading, uh, grazing pressure. You know, if they're grazed down to like that, it's not providing nesting cover. It's not providing brood ground cover. There'll be some good display grounds for birds and so forth, but in terms of habitat value, somewhat limited. So keep that in mind. Um, again, our favorite, or at least my favorite, definitely from a quail standpoint and, and to some extent from a turkey standpoint, are these native uh, warm season grasses. You know, they're great uh, uh, vegetation structure wise. You know, if you like to get a little bit older, get some woody compound in, into them, but more from a brew grain uh, standpoint for those benefits. And you know, if you're looking down at one of these stands, uh, of native grasses, that whole clumpy this nature of the plant provides a lot of space in between those clumps where birds can freely move around. There's not a lot of litter layer down there. Um, you can see we've got some good <coughs> rainy stuff. This here is attracting a lot of bugs. And if you're a uh, 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 turkey pole, boom, boom, you can go around, jump up here, and have a bug here, zip over here, and have a bug there. Holy crap. I'm just said there's a predator, boom. Dive into the edge more at least and burrow down and hide. Okay. It's very easy for birds to navigate through this air uh, uh, type of habitat, which has a lot of a diversity of plants, which is going to attract insects uh, that they're going to be picking on. Okay. Yeah, just some common species, and again, as I mentioned earlier, let's look at diversity. Don't just pick one, I'm going to plant all, all, all little blue stem and be done with it. Okay? You shoot yourself in the foot, getting back to that thought I said earlier, you need to be thinking about diversity. And mixing that with some forbs. Okay? Grass is one thing, forbs are another. This skin, uh, I don't know if Claude or, or, or Ted had covered this, um, but using this and more for spite fire, uh, to manage that succession. Again, we're, we're looking at one to two, three uh, years after some type of disc when you're burning is your brood rearing habitat. Three to five to six, seven years is going to be your, your uh, nesting habitat. And after that, you got to bring it back to some stage of succession. You use it back to the beginning, starting all over. Whether you're burning in a pine forest, burning in a hardwood forest, or you're burning open lands, you're doing the same thing the same way, just in a different environment, okay? It all overlaps. Don't ever get preoccupied, well, this is how we manage forest, this is how we manage pine forest, and then this is how we manage open land. The techniques, the theory, and the concept is universal and the same beneath. You're managing one way or another from here on down, vegetation from here on down. Except when you're in, in forest environment, you're managing the trees the canopy of the trees so you can eventually manage what's on the ground. Now, that's the common theme amongst these past three presentations. I think some of the subsequent ones are going to hit. They're really managing what's from least down. Whether you're, you're doing it in open lands or you're cutting thin trees uh, it, it, to allow sunlight to get down in the forested uh, environment. Well, what, what would it do if you, like a farmer, got out, like he got hundreds of acres he's planting? If he just left so much of it out there for the nesting in the, um, what do you call it? It could do that. I mean, instead of planting the trees, he just left that spot mm -hmm. of land where he just let it grow up or whatever for that seven years or whatever. Yeah, you about. could do that. Uh, 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 whether that kind of gets into whether it's practical for that land or do. You know, if they're an the agricultural producer, uh, uh, you know, just taking out 30 acres and saying, well, you know, I'm going to plant that and put that into uh, turkey habitat. They're losing money because mm -hmm. you know, they're not getting that rental rate or they're not farming it and so forth. Uh, uh, so sometimes, or well, a lot of times, you don't see that with producers. They're very reluctant to do that. Unless 
enroll, they get enrolled in like the conservation reserve program where that's a set aside program funded by the federal government uh, to take lands out of production. Now something like that could be very beneficial, especially in some of uh, the more intensive agricultural landscape, providing that stitch cover for birds. Um, on that stitch cover? Piece of cover yeah. for birds, which that may be the only cover that they have in some of those um, really <clears throat> open, big agricultural areas. Uh, but there's also some issues with that too, because if that's the only cover, predators also know that's the only cover, and, and, and although it may be covered, it looks good, and there's nests there, they may actually be kind of shooting themselves in the foot because predation rates are relatively high, because it's the only source of cover out there. Predators key, key in on that stuff too. Uh, here, here's just kind of an example of a, a, a winter disking. You know, it's pretty much a brim sedge field. Uh, right through here, we ran a disk the following summer. You see the de definite change in vegetation structure. From, from predominantly grass more towards a, a, a grassy form uh, uh, type of plant. Tracking a boatload of insects in here. So that's uh, stuff that come up on his own? Yep. Yeah. No, it did not plant that. This was not planted. Okay? And we got some ragged in there. Maybe a little bit of <coughs> HP scattered in there. Uh, but you're producing natural forage. That's not always the case. A lot of cases you do get that. That's why I, earlier I recommended, you know, it's just not always go out there and plant something. Let's go out there, disc it, let's disc third here, let's burn a third here. Let's see what comes back up. Okay, why make that investment in planting something when you've got a natural seed bank sitting there for you? All you got to do is run a tractor over it. Okay? Just kind of a common sense thing before jumping the gun and, and, and I got to do something, I got to plant something. Let's just, let's do some common sense <coughs> management. Let's tinker around a little bit, see what's in that seed bank, what's going to come up. And uh, uh, a lot of times you'll probably be pleasantly surprised what you got in there. Um, Especially in ag lands, because uh, you never know what what can potentially be in that seed bank. There's some stimulation, turn up that soil, can, 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 can really show you what's in there. I mean, it could be bad. You could pull solid standard Johnson grass. But that's also good to know, because then you can start managing that Johnson grass. Okay. Again, fire. You're, you're about seven or eight slides ahead of me. A very, very valuable management tool. It's again setting back that successional plot to ground zero and then working out from there. Uh, mowing. Uh, most folks on open lands uh, or even forested lands where you're managing food, uh, 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 forest openings have tractors. They also have bush hogs, clear the roads. By and large, mowing. Should, well, no, it definitely should not be your primary management tool. In some cases, yes. Uh, you know, along some of the uh, 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 pine stands that Claude talked about where they opened up or daylighted those roads, I guess would be the technical forestry term. Uh, in some cases there, managing that vegetation height, you can do through uh, the timing of your mowing. Okay, so it's going to coincide, vegetation will be about that tall when those chicks are hatching off. That would be ideal uh, 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 brood-bearing habitat. So you got a mount, so you can look over that stuff, but you got poults that are well hidden. Okay, so you can use mowing, but by and large, don't make it your primary management technique for turkeys. Because this is what I'm talking about. Okay, and especially back from a quail standpoint, somewhat from a deer standpoint. Um, you got a native grass field, you know, that good cover, that high, you know, so some varied somewhat here and there. By mowing, um, what this individual landowner did, took all that cover, put it down on the ground, okay? You've lost potential habitat right there, at least until the following spring when that stuff starts growing back up, okay? The other aspect of is this thatch buildup. If they don't burn it or disc it and they continue just cutting, they're getting that building up, building up, building up. We'll get some grasses shooting up in through there and so forth. But that thatch is what makes it tough for a turkey pole or a quail chick to get through and catch bugs. Okay, so you're doing 
two bad things are happening at the same time when you get into the habit of using mowing as your primary management tool. Okay. Again, uh, that's really what we're shooting for, whether it's native grass or, or uh, 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 that's planted or it's natural regen. Um, those early succession communities are really what we're shooting for. Uh, buffer practices, they can uh, be used uh, to increase land lands for turkeys. This is very, very attractive practice for producers who, who want to do habitat management, but they don't want to take their entire field out of production. This kind of offers you a, an option uh, instead of an either or, you kind of have your cake and eat it too. Uh, and there's a lot of farm bill programs out or, uh, program, or programs and conservation practices that can help land art uh, uh, offset uh, some of those costs of putting these in. Now, they work great for quail, and we know just because of vegetation structure that they do provide some habitat for turkeys. But this is definitely not going to turn your turkey population around overnight. Okay, This is more of a supplemental practice when it comes to turkeys. They may nest it, they may not. There's also some predation issues when you put habitat in a long linear feature <coughs> along, uh, uh, um, in this case, an ag field. Okay, when it's narrow, it's small patch, it's linear, it's also a good trap corridor for predators. Try one on yet? Huh. <coughs> Go in and, and nail a bird sitting on the nest, potentially. Okay? So when you start putting habitat in long, narrow patches, you got to kind of worry, especially when it comes to nesting habitat, uh, that are you setting up a trap? That's why the, you know, a lot of the management uh, that we talked about over, or already, the pine forest management, the hardwood management, the whole field management is important because now, instead of a long, narrow feature along an ag field, which you know provides excellent brood rearing uh, uh, habitat for turkeys, but, but when you imagine the whole 20, 30 acre forest, it's much more difficult for a predator to find a nest within that 20, 30 acres than it is along a well-defined, narrow strip of habitat along an ag field. So keep that in mind uh, uh, when you start thinking, getting creative uh, with, with turkey management. But they are a valuable tool. You can see this landowner right here. Uh, these were intentionally managed uh, uh, field waters that are left out of production, and that was just natural regeneration that we allowed those to come up with. Some areas he did well, got a lot of ragweed, other areas got a lot of Johnson grass, and other areas uh, got a lot of Bermuda grass, which crept into them, okay, which, which made them relatively uh, poor habitat. But in that case, you got to come back to the herbicide and just hammer it, hammer it, hammer it uh, until you kill that Bermuda and, and then either replant something or and try again uh, with natural succession. <clears throat> a little bit closer view of them now, you can see, uh, you know, I'll look at that and say, that's brewberry habitat. That's a boatload of insects sitting in that ragweed. Uh, here's a different border. This is native grass border. Uh, you know, turkeys will nest in there occasionally, but preferably have them nest elsewhere, okay, in larger blocks, and they'll probably select up that also. You know, as I mentioned earlier, if you're a coyote, you know, that's a perfect place to go walking right along that edge. If this is about 20, 30 feet wide, there's a good probability you might smell you sitting on a nest. Go ahead and nail me. Or a raccoon. You might be along this wooded edge. If it's narrow and short, good chance, of, yeah, they can probably come in there and smell you and, and, and get you. As opposed, you know, this whole entire field where nesting habitat then it's a maze. It's a lot harder to pinpoint a specific nest. And this is one that actually was planted in orchard peas, creating that early succession, and you can see that some effect here. Uh, again, natural succession sometimes can be your best management technique. You can see what's there before you, you get into planting something. Uh, another thing which you generally recommend is don't do everything all at once. You need to re retain some nesting and some brood rearing habitat on your property at, at any given period. Okay, so birds can actually use it. You go ahead and prescribe burn all, all your fields, the whole you know 300 acres of it of your property. You don't have a stitch of cover left for birds. Okay, pine forest, the same thing. Burn, burn. 
all three here, three, four hundred acres of my property each each year are on the same schedule. Well, that creates a problem because some years you got good habitat, some years you don't. It's kind of want it's like a mutual fund. Diversify your investment. We'll have some in nesting habitat. We'll have some in brood rearing habitat. We'll have some more nesting habitat over here. Some more brood rearing habitat over here. Mix your property up, okay, where you have habitat on it and how you're managing uh, that nesting and brood rearing habitat. And likewise, not just across your entire property uh, stands, but also within a stand, okay? You can manage succession in a 10 acre field. We're going to dis this 50% of it in year one, we'll dis 50% of it in year two. In year three, three, maybe we may skip a year and then come back to that, that, that first 50% we dis and dis that up. Okay, so that way if you're a turkey pole and you got to run around, you hatch out here in your nesting habitat, you don't have far to go before you get into your brood rearing habitat. Okay, minimizing that travel distance is energy and it's also a predation risk. Okay, that's the importance of having your habitats close together. Uh, Getting again to hardwood plantings depends on what you want to use them for. Okay? Yeah, the, the corridors that you talked about to link up major uh, woodlots is a good idea to provide those corridors where birds uh, are more comfortable traveling through, moving from one area to another. Uh, turkeys, again, it depends on, on what landscape context you're in. If you're in a very intensive agricultural landscape, that becomes important, okay, more so. And at a much broader scale, oftentimes there will be multiple properties uh, that you're working with. Uh, again, we saw this earlier. Uh, but getting back to, 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 to the common themes that you've seen already, nesting habitat, brewing habitat. I think by now you should have a general idea of what we're talking about when we say nesting habitat. That kind of partially shrubby. Uh, uh, interspersed or, 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 or understory of grass and forest, but interspersed with, with shrubby, woody stuff, which is just starting to come up. You know, hitting that time where, yeah, we got to think about doing something before it gets out of control. You know, because if that woody, shrubby stuff gets too big, then you got to definitely come back in with a herbicide and knock it down. Um, but if you catch it early enough to fire, uh, 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 you may be able to, 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 to kill it off, depending on what time of, of year you burn and so forth. That's your nesting habitat. Your brood rank is those one to two to three years right after you burn. Okay? You've, the previous two speakers have said the exact same. 